Hello everybody, it's Dr. Alex Earl. We're here at Pure Plastic Surgery today, and it's hump day with Dr. Alex Earl. Uh, this is the time I get to spend with you guys and answer a whole bunch of questions and go over surgery topics, okay? Uh, so today we'll definitely have time for questions, but I did want to start the day with a, what I think is an interesting topic and something that we often get a lot of questions about. Um, and so I kind of wanted to go through a few things regarding liposuction, okay? Of course, we do a lot of liposuction here at Pure, whether it's Lipo360 or, of course, a lipo that comes with a BBL. Uh, and so we often get a lot of questions about the type of lipo that we do, the techniques that we use, um, and things of that nature. And, uh, and, you know, and also what can be kind of added to the liposuction uh, to help with things such as skin tightening, okay? So we're gonna go over uh, those subjects here to start. Uh, of course, then we, uh, we haven't answered any questions regarding this subject in particular uh, or any other plastic surgery subject, really, because uh, we got uh, 30 minutes here uh, to spend with each other on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl, okay? All right, so let's uh, jump into it and get started, okay? So the first thing I want to talk about are kind of the different types of liposuction, okay? Uh, kind, of the, kind of the most kind of bare bones uh, technique is what uh, people just call tumescent lipo, okay? All lipo nowadays is tumescent lipo, meaning that the first step to any lipo uh, procedure is actually instilling that tumescent fluid. What is that tumescent fluid? For, for it's, it's of course uh, IV fluid, like normal saline, uh, is a typical one that's being used, okay? Uh, and within that fluid, you're placing either epi, epinephrine alone, or epinephrine and lidocaine, okay? All right. Now, when do you use lidocaine? That's for people that typically do liposuction, uh, awake liposuction, okay? So you gotta put something in there to kind of numb the tissues uh, so that the patient is able to tolerate the liposuction. And that's typically when you use the lipocaine, uh, lidocaine, excuse me. Now here, uh, you know, since we do all, most of our big liposuction procedures or pretty much all of our big lipo procedures under general anesthesia, I don't use lidocaine. I only use the epinephrine. What's the epinephrine for? The epinephrine is to cause vasoconstriction so that there's less bleeding throughout the procedure, okay? All right, so many people ask the question, Dr. Earl, why don't you do awake, uh, you know, awake liposuction, okay? And actually, this is one of the main reasons. Well, when you do awake liposuction, you have to add the lidocaine, which adds another potential for, uh, for a complication, which is lidocaine toxicity. Okay, uh, there's been some you know, unfortunate incidents. I think one was in the ER uh, with that. Uh, but if you put uh, either too much lidocaine within your one liter bag, or you use too many liter bags of lidocaine, you can have what's called lidocaine toxicity. Uh, and that can lead to very, very serious, both cardiac and neurologic consequences, and potentially even hospitalization and death. Okay, so I eliminate that risk altogether. Okay, we do it under general anesthesia and I don't use lidocaine, only the epinephrine, okay? Um, that's the kind of the most standard technique. Uh, then we have what's called power-assisted liposuction. That's what we do here at Pure. So that's mechanical energy. We have a device, it's called the microair, if you wanna look it up. Uh, and what it does is that it ha the cannula actually kind of vibrates and moves you know, forward and back, forward and back, and has some mechanical energy to it. And the advantage of that is that it is easier to get through the tissues. It is less uh, kind of fatigue for the surgeon. Um, you are able to get a little bit, you know, a bit more fat out than just using my arm alone, okay? Uh, and I do think it tends to be a bit smoother as well. Uh, so there's a few advantages to using the power system, uh, liposuction, the microair. Uh, that's why uh, we have it here at Pure, okay? Uh, but there is no energy to it, okay? It does not impart heat, all right? Because that's what brings us to the next two. The, the, one, the next one is laser liposuction, okay? You uh, probably have heard of it being called smart lipo. Smart lipo is just a marketing tenor, uh, term. There's nothing necessarily smart <laughs> about it. Uh, that's just a term that the marketing people came up with. But it is laser lipo, okay, and it adds an extra step, okay? So in your typical liposuction procedure, you essentially have two steps, right? You infiltrate with the tumescent fluid, and then you suction, you know, whether it's just your hand power suction or your power assisted suction. When you do laser lipo, there's an additional step. The first step is still adding the tumescent fluid, but the second step is actually using the, the probe that has a laser at the end of it, and that laser does impart heat, okay? It imparts heat, and the theoretical advantage of that is that it basically melts away the fat, uh, and 
it uh, allows for skin tightening or skin contraction, okay? Those are the theoretical advantages of the laser liposuction. Now, what are some of the disadvantages? Well, melted fat is not, does not work for grafting, okay? So if you're doing a BBL, you can't melt all that fat because you're killing those fat cells. And of course, if you move around dead fat cells, that's gonna do absolutely nothing for you, okay? Uh, and the other thing is you, you have to have a lot of experience. You really have to know what you're doing so that you don't cause unfortunate burns for the patients, okay? Because it is heat, you can, and if you get too close or if it, it, it gets too hot, you could potentially cause an, a thermal burn or thermal injury, okay? Um, and the other thing is that the incidence of uh, fibrosis is higher with uh, laser liposuction uh, if you're not you know, uh, potentially doing it correctly. So all those things uh, come into play. So we don't do that here at Pure, okay? The last one is called VASER, okay? Another marketing term, okay? So, so people compute, oh, is it laser, is it VASER? Well, it's VASER with a V, okay? Uh, and VASER liposuction also uses energy, but it's a different type of energy. It uses ultrasound energy, okay? Now this is very different than your regular imaging ultrasound, okay? Imaging ultrasound does not impart energy, does not impart heat. It basically it uses the sound waves to create an image. That's what I use to, of course, you know, transfer the fat so I know where my camera is. That's not the same thing as using ultrasound energy, okay? Ultrasound energy does impart heat, very similar to the, the laser, so it imparts heat. It, if, you, if you impart enough heat, you can kill the fat cells again, melt away the fat cells, um, and also it does have the theoretic, theoretical advantage of skin tightening, okay? Um, so people that use the VASER say that they get better skin tightening uh, with that versus say just your hand or power assistant, okay? Again, the disadvantages are that potentially you injure those fat cells and therefore they're not useful for, for fat transfer or fat grafting, okay? And again, if you get too close or too hot, you can potentially cause a thermal injury, okay? So those are the potential disadvantages um, and we don't, we don't use that here at Pure. But I mean, I've had, I've seen people have great results result with it. So like anything, you gotta go with someone who has a lot of experience with that particular machine and that particular technique uh, to make sure you get a good result there. So what are the adjuncts then? So you're like, Dr. O, well, okay, you use the power system, um, that's great. Um, you don't use any lidocaine, so you eliminate that risk, that's awesome. But what do you do if we wanna get a little bit more skin tightening because you, know, you just told me that the laser and the laser do better with skin tightening, okay. So what we do then is we add an adjunct, okay? We add something to the light bulb. The two biggest ones out there, the most commonly known are J-plasma uh, and body type, okay? They both use uh, now a, a different type of energy than these two. This is called RF energy, a radio frequency type energy. So it is energy, it does impart some uh, level of heat, uh, and that's what allows for the skin tightening, okay? So here, here we use the body type, Okay, and we typically use it, uh, and so it does add a step as well. Uh, and we typically do it after, uh, so if we're gonna be doing transfer, then we're gonna be doing it after we remove the fat from the area. If it's, if it's we're not doing transfer, then typically we do it uh, before we remove the fat from the area, okay? Um, so say we're doing the arms and I'm not gonna use that arm fat, uh, then I will do the tumescent fluid, then I will use the body type, and then I do some liposuction. That's the order of how things would go. Uh, say a patient wants um, a little bit more skin tightening the abdomen, and I have to use that fat for transfer because they don't have enough fat from other areas, then I would do the tumescent fluid, the liposuction, and then the body type, okay? So we switch the order around depending on the needs. Because similarly to this and this, once you use that body type, you use that RF energy, you're gonna be killing fat cells, okay? You're gonna part heat upon those fat cells, they're gonna melt away, they're gonna die, basically, and they're not useful for transfer. Okay, uh, why do I like the body type as opposed to the J-plasma? I think it has more safety features to it. Um, it lets me know when things get too hot and it actually kind of turns off automatically. Uh, so I really, really like that about it. It basically tells me exactly kind of what temperature is you know, at the skin level and what temperature is at the deeper tissue level. Uh, and I'm able to adjust those settings and make sure things uh, don't get too, too hot to try to minimize the risk of burns uh, with those machines, okay? Can you get lipo burn with power assisted liposuction? And if so, how do you prevent it? Yes, so the, so the answer is yes, and, and, we, and we should get into that a little bit, okay? So um, let me, so I think you guys got this, so I'm gonna go ahead and erase that for now. Um, okay, so, 
So we're talking now about lipoberms, okay? Lipoberms. So there's different types of, of berms. So berm is basically, uh, in turn, in this for this particular subject, uh, it's a broad term, okay? Because you can have your your kind of your regular lipoberm, and then you can have your thermal injuries, okay? All right, and then uh, there's also faha burns. All right, so a faha burn is basically when the faha is too tight and rubbing a, an area in the skin where you just had you know a procedure had lipo uh, you had liposuction and that skin is very very sensitive and if you have an area that's kind of digging or either digging into you or rubbing uh, or too tight in a certain area that can cause what's called a faha burn. Now, again, we're using the term burn loosely because it's not a thermal injury, not like what you normally think of, like when you, you know, you put your hand on the stove. Uh, that's, a, that's what really, you know, that's a, that's a true definition of a burn. But, you know, we use the term kind of loosely, uh, but that, uh, would then, what that causes a faha burn, okay? Then you have your, so the most kind of easiest one to understand are your thermal injuries, right? So if you use a laser or a vaser uh, and it gets too hot, that is going to impart heat and that's an actual burn. So that's a thermal injury. Okay. That's going to kind of like you're, you're burning the skin from the inside. Okay. All right. And that's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. The one that's a little bit more difficult to understand because it's kind of a misnomer is your kind of your regular lipo burn with either, either power assisted lipo or your regular tumescent lipo. And the reason is because it's not an actual burn. It's not a thermal injury, but what it is, it's typically due to a couple of things, either, uh, you know, the skin there got devascularized, meaning that after the liposuction procedure didn't get enough blood flow, and so then that skin uh, becomes um, ischemic, okay? And a certain portion of that skin may die or become necrotic, okay? And people call that a lipo burn. Uh, and then the other thing is, and is uh, also if you, if you injure a particular section of the skin uh, by hitting it kind of too often with the tip of the cannula. So if you're doing liposuction, and there's, you know, say you're really trying to work that way, so you're going to get that snatched look, um, and you're kind of really hitting that, that area hard, um, and, and, it, and the cannula tip is hitting a specific portion of the skin, you can cause, uh, theoretically, an injury there, which can then, of, of course, lead to, you know, less blood flow, um, less oxygenation, so an ischemic injury, and again, that's also called, called a lipo burn, okay? So there's really, what increases your risk of a lipo burn? if you are too aggressive okay so if you try to you know some patients often say you know doc you know suck all the fat um, if you're too aggressive and you suck away and you're really sucking away all the fat and you're leaving like almost no fat between that skin and that muscle your risk of your of this type of burn uh you know is goes is is higher it goes up okay that's why i i like to leave about, you know, just a little bit of fat underneath that skin, about a centimeter or so, I do my best to try to leave that because that will decrease the risk of a lipo burn and also decreases the risk of fibrosis. So the more aggressive the liposuction is, uh, the higher the risk of lipo burns and the higher the risk of fibrosis. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit hard to balance because, uh, you know, you always get a lot of patients, you know, wanting, wanting that aggressive liposuction, you know, you know suck me dry, you know, give me that snatched look, take out as much as you can. We get these requests all the time, but we have to, so so on the one hand, you wanna be, you know, aggressive to the point where the patient's gonna be satisfied, but on the other hand, you have to be careful because, you know, the more aggressive we are, the higher the risk of these things go. So that's why in places, say, uh, where we know that they're, you know, they're, they're more aggressive, say like the DR or sometimes in Colombia, uh, you see more people with lipo burns uh, because they're doing more aggressive lipo uh, in those places. How many liters of fat can you take out if you're combining it with a breast dog or a breast lift? Right, so in, in Florida, uh, we have specific rules as to how much fat can be removed when it's combined with another procedure, okay? So if you're combining the liposuction with pretty much any procedure, uh, whether it's a breast procedure, a tummy tuck, arm lift, or whatever else it may be, uh, you're limited to 1,000 cc's of supernatant fat removal, okay? Now, if you're doing liposuction on its own or with fat transfer or with something such as body type, but you're not making an incision, you're not making a cut, uh, then, of course, then, then we have our limit 
which everybody, I think most people know about, which is 4,000 cc's uh, in one setting. That is our, these limits are set, uh, or, you know, set upon us by the Florida Department of Health. Okay. Uh, we're not supposed to go above these limits. All right. Um, and, and I don't. And so that's why, you know, sometimes you get patients with higher BMIs. Okay. BMI is 30, 31, 32 to our max is 33.5. Okay. And when we remove four liters, you know, there may be some fat left behind because they have more, more than, you know, that amount of fat within their trunk or their body. Okay, and that has to be accepted because the, the rules here are the four liters is the max. That's as, as far as I can go. And you sit in those, you know, so those particular patients just have to know that they're gonna need more than one round uh, potentially to achieve the look that they want. Okay, it just has to be something that has to be internalized and accepted. Okay? How do you prevent fibrosis? So, all right, so that's a great question. So the one thing that, uh, that the surgeon can do, like I said, is not be too aggressive and try to leave you know, just a, a layer of fat underneath that skin, about a centimeter or so, uh, and that and that definitely helps. But, and so that's one part. But the, I, what I think is really the most important part to prevent fibrosis is actually your post-op care. It's just as important or more important in, in preventing fibrosis than what's done, you know, in the OR, okay? Because, for example, you know, over a thousand BBLs, I've been doing this for a long time. I do liposuction pretty much, you know, similarly on all patients, but of course there's a very few, you know, there's a few cohort of patients that could end up getting fibrosis. A lot of times it's because they, they weren't having uh, adequate post-op care. Okay, so what does that mean? That means your compression, okay, uh, which most patients can do, but, but this is a part where it really, really varies. It is the massage therapist, okay that you go to all right because that makes a world of difference you have to go to a massage therapist who has a lot of experience with post lymphatic post lipo massage okay there's not someone you're going to find in the massage envy okay is a person that has experience with you know large volume liposuction procedures and knows how to treat that skin uh in order to minimize the risk of fibrosis that is the biggest difference right there okay so you want to prevent fibrosis the first thing you got to do is make sure you go, you find and you go to a massage therapist that has a lot of experience with this type of procedure and that you do a minimum, absolute minimum of 10 massages, which is, but that's the absolute minimum. 15 or even 20 is not unusual. So you got to think about that ahead of time. You got to budget for that ahead of time. You got to book your appointments ahead of time because if you skip those steps, your chances of fibrosis, skin laxity, you know, skin not retracting well, skin not retracting evenly, all these things goes way, way up. Why is it impossible to do, to do a BBL and breast dog at the same time, or why won't you do it? So for the very same, for this very same reason here, so if I'm doing a breast dog, I'm limited to a thousand cc's, which means I then have to split that 500 cc's per side, and for most patients, they're not gonna, you know, they're not satisfied with that. Now, if you're on the lower BMI side, say you're a BMI of 22, uh, and you tell me, I just want a small change to the buttock. I don't want any, you know, I want a very, very kind of natural, enhanced natural look, uh, and that's all I'm going for. Then sure, you know, we can do your breast dog, we do, a, you know, we do your liposuction, remove the thousand cc's, we do 500 per side, and then that's it. Uh, but you have to understand that, right? You have to internalize that. That's all the lipo that you're getting. That's all the fat transfer that you're getting. And if you're going to be happy with that, then it can be done. But most patients honestly are not going to be happy with that. They want more fat removed, they want more fat placed. And so then in, in that, if you want to have the best results from each of the procedures, it's best to separate out the procedures. That's one thing. The second thing is technically, how are you going to recover, right? You have a fresh breast dog, you definitely don't want to be laying on those implants. That's going to be a problem, okay? You have fresh, you're fresh from uh, fat transfer to the buttock. You don't want to be laying on the buttock. So how are, <laughs> how are you going to be, right? Uh, you can't lay on your stomach and you can't lay on your back. So uh, for those patients that do end up doing things like that, they typically uh, buy a special chair. They, they, it's, for some reason, it's called a zero gravity chair. I'm not sure why it's called that exactly. Uh, but basically there's a cutout uh, and so the buttocks they would kind of hang uh, from there. Uh, and, and so that way there's less pressure in the buttock as they sit in that chair and they're not putting pressure on the implants. But then again, that's something you're gonna have to think about you know, ahead of time. You know, how are you going to recover uh, from both the breast and the buttock? I know you might have touched on this topic already, but using the lipo technique that you use, how do you prevent lipo burn? 
Um, I think we just described it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like I said, we try to we we try to not be overly aggressive. We try to leave that one centimeter of fat uh, underneath the skin. Uh, try not to hit an area, you know, multiple times. Um, and having all that again, it's a balance um, because we want to be aggressive enough, such that the patient is happy with the results, such that we can cinch the waist as much as we can, uh, but not overly aggressive, such that we're increasing the risk of the lipo burns um, and the fibrosis. So, um, so it all has to be. T so, is it a risk? It's definitely a risk in the procedure. Uh, has it happened to me? Yes, it has happened to me. Does it happen to me often? Absolutely not. It is very, it's, you know, it's rare cases. It, it, it does happen. Uh, you know, some patients are more prone to it than others. Uh, also, you know, say, you know, older patients, ex-smokers, uh, well-controlled diabetics, uh, patients with comorbidities, you know, high blood pressure. All these types of pac patients are going now for round two or round three. Um, you know, these types of patients have a higher risk uh, because their blood supply is not as good. And it really, it's all about blood supply. During a tummy tuck, what type of lipo and what areas of liposuction is performed? Yeah, so during a tummy tuck, the most common uh, areas of lipo are to the flanks and the waist. The type of lipo is the same that, that we always use, which is that power assisted lipo. Um, and that's most commonly the areas that we hit. Sometimes we do a little to the light, to the abdomen itself. Sometimes I like to etch out the little middle part here. Uh, we've been doing a, um, a fair amount of etching combined with the tummy tuck uh, lately. Um, and it, it looks it looks really really beautiful and we're gonna have some photos of that for you, uh, you guys soon on our Instagram uh, But for the right patient so a patient whose BMI is not too too high um, We can do we can combine some etching with your tummy tuck for a very very beautiful result I've seen doctors advertise safe lipo. Do you know anything about that? Yeah uh, so safe lipo is an acronym uh, again also a marketing term, <laughs> okay um, but it is an acronym. Okay. All right. So it stands for separation, aspiration, and fat equalization. Okay. It's a technique that you, that you use for liposuction. We, we, we do it here too. Pretty much, you know, most people nowadays will do it, although not everybody advertises it. Is it any safer than any other type of lipo? It's not. It's just an acronym and it's a marketing term. So, um, all right, so, so what, is it, what does it mean, okay? So separation means that before you actually do the suction, you put the cannula in and you kind of, you kind of do like a, a pre-tunneling kind of thing. So you're basically doing the same maneuvers, but you're not on suction, okay? And that kind of prepares the tissues for the second step, which is the aspiration. So then you go to suction, and you do your liposuction, okay? You, you remove all the fat you're gonna remove, you do all the contouring, you're gonna contour, liposculpture, whether it's HD, ab etching, or whatever it is that you're gonna do, okay? And then, at the end, you do what's called fat equalization. So, uh, so once again, you remove the suction, and then with your cannula, you kind of shift it around, okay? You can shift it around in, in, in you know, kind of like a fanning type motion to try to equalize the fat and try to smooth out the fat, okay? And then the reason for that is to try to prevent, you know, leaving like, you know, tunneling marks uh, or, you know, uh, inconsistencies or contour irregularities, okay? So that's that's the, the, the reason for that last step, okay? And it's something that I would say probably most liposuction surgeons nowadays, including myself, uh, do just kind of as, as an ordinary part of the procedure, okay? Um, but, is it safer? Uh, it's not necessarily safer. It's just an acronym, um, and again, it's a marketing term. For girls with a lower BMI, is filling the hip dips possible? Uh, yeah, yeah, typically it is. Um, so if you you know if you want us to focus on the hips, um, we can certainly do that. So a question we often get is, um, when you do a BBL, do you have to address the buttock? Can we just address the hips? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can certainly do that. Now, is it going to you know change in terms of like the pricing or anything else? Or no, it's not because. You know, it's still pretty much the same procedure, except I'm not adding a lot of fat to the buttock itself. I'm adding most of the fat to the hips. But overall, you know, it's, it's a very, very similar procedure. We're still doing your lipo 360. You know, we're still preparing the fat. We're still transferring that fat. We're just transferring it to the specific areas you want me to do. But yeah, there is no cookie cutter, cookie cutter type of surgery here. All right, I wanna 
kind of develop the plan to, to the specifics of what that patient wants, okay? Uh, and so that's why we have a pre-op the day before. Uh, if you want to bring wish picks, that's okay. If you want to bring a vision board, uh, that's okay. I have a lot of fun with those. Uh, and then I try to tailor the plan to what uh, you want. But also, that's when I have to try to really hard, uh, and I know, I know that's something that I, I, can, I continuously try to work on, but I have to uh, basically set the expectations, right? I have to look at your photos, your vision board, uh, and decide whether you know, it's realistic or not. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially with like, you know, when people just showing photos from like Instagram models or things like that, it's not quite realistic. Um, and I have to kind of point that out. Um, you know, is it a bad thing not necessarily? Because, you know, it kind of gives me a, a general idea what types of shape you like, okay? And I can kind of strive for that within your foundation and your frame, okay? But it has to be understood that if you're starting at a very, very different foundation than, you know, where in the photo that you're showing me, that the end result can't be the same, okay? Also, a lot of those Instagram models are either Photoshop uh, and or they've had multiple rounds. And of course, they don't, you know, a lot of times they don't, they don't say that. So, uh, or they're taking the photos at like very specific angles. That's another trick uh, that is used. So, this is what I always try to tell my patients. Don't, you know, yes, you can bring the photos, you can bring your vision board, and it does help me plan, but don't compare yourself with other people, okay? It's all about you, how you feel about yourself. Did you have a positive change? If you did, then we're winning, okay? And it's not about whether at the end of the, at the, end of the day, do you look exactly like this photo that you shot with me, or this vision board that you brought, uh, or this other patient that I did, or anything like that, because it's not, it's not about that. It's about empowering women, so empowering that specific patient having that patient be feel better about themselves, increasing their self-confidence and their self-esteem. And then really at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Thank you for that. And I know you touched on this a little bit ago, but really quick, how many massages do you need post-op and how long is a massage session usually? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So like I said, so the minimum, the minimum, absolute minimum is 10. All right. That is strictly the minimum. 15 or even 20 is not unusual. And if you're gonna budget, I would budget for 20, okay? And the more that you get, especially by a, by a well-trained professional post-lipo uh, lymphatic massage therapist, the better your final outcome would be, okay? Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's why I say, you know, think ahead, budget for more uh, if you can. And okay? how long is the session, you should say? So, so the sessions vary also in terms of when it is in your, in, the, in, in your, uh, post-operative period that you're getting in, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first few sessions are not gonna be very long. They're gonna be probably 20 to 30 minutes, okay? Your fresh post-op, remember, you're gonna be in pain. Uh, and, the, and the goal of the massage at that point in time uh, is mostly to remove excess fluid and to, then, and to start to get the skin to drape back uh, the way we want it to, okay? So for all those reasons, those tend to be shorter uh, and they tend to be somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes, okay? As you progress along, then the, the goal of the massage starts to shift to more like body contouring and again, preventing fibrosis and getting the skin to try to lay down and retract as best and smoothly as possible, okay? Those massages then tend to be a bit longer. They can go, you know, now, now we're talking more into like the 45 minute to one hour range, okay? Uh, typically, they don't go longer than an hour. The other thing that's gonna happen as you move along your recovery process is that these massage therapists, these act, you know, especially the experts, they have adjunct therapies that they can use when needed, okay? So that's when, uh, you know, things you may have heard of such as uh, wood therapy, cavitation, carboxy treatments, um, all these things come in. Um, ultrasound therapy, which is again, uh, can also potentially help. So a great massage therapist is able to identify a potential issue early, okay? Add any other therapies uh, if needed and prevent it from progressing uh, any further or reversing, you know, what, what could you know, potentially happen, okay? And that's why it's so, so important. How long do you have to wait to smoke THC after surgery? Um, well, I, I, is it gonna affect, you know, the way you heal all the things that it's not, but I wouldn't mix it with your pain medication and things like that. So if you're on the Percocet, you know, don't, don't, you know, do a lot of THC at the same time, okay? Remember, you're not gonna, you're not feeling great, 
you're probably feeling a little weak, a little lightheaded. You know, you pop a Percocet, you do some THC, next thing you know, you're dropping to the floor. You don't want that, okay? Don't do that. So I would say wait at least a week, okay? Get through your antibiotics, get through, you know, your, your pain medication. And once you're done with that, then it's okay. But remember, make sure, make sure, make sure there's no nicotine. So I don't know, whichever form you take your THC, make sure there's no nicotine laced with it, okay? Because that will affect your results. All right, we're already at half an hour. That was very quick. But before you right. go, let me try to get a question. Yeah, let's I wish do it. we could answer them all. Uh, if you get if you get a tummy tuck, what's the chances that in, what's the chances of needing additional lipo in the future? So it, it's it's probable because again, uh, when, you know, when we're weighing things and and determining how aggressive we want to be, different surgeons have different uh, you know levels of how aggressive they want to be. But when you're doing a, a, a tummy tuck, for the most part. Okay, um, for me, I don't like to do a lot of lipo in this kind of central abdominal region, okay? And the reason is because that's the very same skin that we're lifting up, that we're completely undermining, that we're taking away all that blood supply, and then we're stretching it down, putting it on tension, okay, uh, to be able to remove as much excess skin as possible. So you're already doing a lot to that, that skin, and if you then add a whole bunch of lipo to it and you're too aggressive, then what happens? That skin can die, okay? Skin necrosis, all right? Uh, and that's not good, okay? So I, I don't do a lot of lipo in that central kind of skin area. We do the lipo over here in the flanks, in the waist. You know, sometimes we do, we kind of come into the abdomen a little bit there, uh, especially now with this new technique that we're doing with, uh, when we're kind of etching and doing the tummy tuck at the same time. Uh, we'll come in here, we'll kind of etch that out, we'll etch it out here. We'll do a little bit in that central portion there to make a nice little kind of indentation there. Okay, but I'm not going to do a lot of lipo here and here. So is it possible you may want to do some lipo there afterwards? Definitely it's a possibility. A lot of patients then also ask, you know, they have a good amount of excess fat uh, and they have a good amount of excess skin. And, uh, and they have fat in the back. When I'm, typically when I'm doing a mommy makeover or tummy tuck, I'm not addressing the back at all, okay? The patient is laying face up. I'm not turning the patient. So, uh, so yeah, so a lot of times you can do a tummy tuck and then come back and do a lipo 360 or come back and do a BBL. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Okay, well, I think actually that was a, a great uh, subject here today. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, and I uh, really, really love the interactions here today. So uh, I want you guys to also check out a lot of the videos that we have on, uh, on IGTV. So if you go to Instagram, at your place of surgery, you can hit the IGTV little icon there. There's a lot of information there. The other thing you can do is you can go to our YouTube channel, right? Um, our YouTube channel is called Pure Plastic Surgery, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, That's so you go, go to YouTube, go to Pure Plastic Surgery, subscribe to the channel and you can watch a whole bunch of informative video videos and a whole bunch of these lives that we do uh, and get a lot, a lot of good information from a double board certified plastic surgeon, okay? All right, everybody. So I will catch you guys next week on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Ciao. Bye.